My name is Eliane. I'm from Brazil, and today I'm happy to share with you my master's research about an amazing phenomenon that happens in the Amazon. So let's get started. A little introduction first. A area in cetivorous populations are on the decline, especially long distance migrants, and this includes the Popo Morton. So it's only natural that we have many questions about it, like are they being predated? Are they losing habitat? Are they being contaminated? Or is there a lack of resource? But before we can answer these questions, we need to go back for a moment and ask, where can we find them? In the case of the Popo Morton, many of you can easily find them in your backyard every spring season. But the distribution of this bird has a continental scale, and every winter season they go south. To South America, where our knowledge about the winter season is still not as evident as we wanted. This has an impact on conservation because we need to know where they are and what they are doing before formulating plans to protect those birds throughout the whole distribution. But how do we find a bird in the middle of such a big continent like South America? Well, they made it a little bit easier for us thanks to a common behavior that many migratory birds have to form roosts. I believe many of you already know what is a roost, but if you want a definition, a roost is a place where birds regularly settle or congregate, congregate to rest at night. This behavior turns the birds conspicuous, were giving us more chances to find it. And it is actually by looking for roosts that a team of researchers found one in Brazil, in the middle of Amazon, close to the capital city of the state of Amazonas, Manaus. The roost impresses not only for the number of birds, but because a phenomenon like that is not that common in the Amazon. This opens an opportunity to study more about the winter season of the Popo Morton, because roosts can be way more than a place to sleep. They can also be an important place to prepare for a long journey, a staging ground. So why they stay here, there, they can also be storing energy, like building fat reserves or gaining weight, or finishing modes to keep the flying capabilities. And then can also be avoiding predation by staying close to its similars and have less chance to be caught. So it's only natural that we have many questions about a roost, but the ones I tried to answer were how many are there by estimating the numbers, for how long do they stay, and which body traits might be defining their stay at the roost. For example, are young birds staying more because they need more time to prepare? Do fat birds stay less because they are ready to go? And of course, I also did some general description of behavior at the roost. So about counts and behavior at the roost. Just for some more info about our study area, the roost is, loca the roost is located on the outskirts of the urban area of the city of Manaus, on the lower Rio Negro, one of the biggest rivers in the Amazon. It is an island of more or less five hectares, dominated by typical flood plain vegetation. It floods periodically from December to June, so when the Popo Morton is there from late January to April, the island is almost entirely underwater, with exception of the treetops. And for every night the Popo Morton is there, they display this reunion ritual at their arrival. The first individuals arrive at the roost during sunset around 6 10 p.m. For several minutes, they fly over and circle the island while forming a never increasing cloud of birds as more individuals arrive and join the flock. After the cloud of birds reach a high volume, the descent toward the island begins in what is almost a straight line high speed dive followed by the flock disappears into the trees and it ends around 6, 6 40 p.m. The departure in the morning starts around sunrise, around 5.50 a.m., with the martin living in rows as if they were streams parallel to the river water, and take altitude only when they, become, they move several meters away from the roofs. They, are, they do not gather in flocks at this time and no, as no birds remain flying over the roofs. The, the, those streams of birds are usually interspersed with moments of zero activity that become more frequent as the days get lighter. By six and by six thirty, most of the birds already left the roost. 
And why am I explaining this behavior? Because it is important for a counting method. It is easier to count in the mornings when compared to the afternoons because the birds fly in a single direction and parallel to the water. So what the observer who is counting must do is to imagine a point on the stream of birds and estimate how many individuals per second are passing through this imaginary point. At the same time, the observer will be timing the total duration of the stream, which we will call interval. With each change in the number of the individuals per second, the observer must change the interval on the time, which will start count from zero again, and estimate the new number of birds passing through this imaginary point. At the end, we will have a series of two measurements, number of birds per second and the total duration of the stream. Then we just multiply and obtain the final number for those strings of birds. But the birds are coming out of every corner of the island. So how do you deal with that? Well, by having two boats, one on each side of the island. Each boat has four observers divided into two pairs. They stay back to back looking at the opposite sides. While one person times, the other take notes of the number of birds. At the end, we take the results of every pair of observers to obtain the total count of birds for the day. So thanks to the pandemic and the fact that the method, method requires people, we couldn't count as much as we want. But what we have is in February 2020, we counted 321,000 birds. On March 2020, we counted 266,000 birds. And after a long time locked at our homes, on March 2022, we estimated 244,000 birds. And it's worth noting, noting that each time we had different observers. And the numbers, as you can see, are more or less similar, which may suggest that the method is working. Now, for the influence of purple martin body condition on roost permanence. Well, we collected some measurements we judged it could be relevant to the stay at the roost. Those were aging sex that can be easily identified by the plumage, fat score, in which you can classify by looking at the fat reserve at the chest, muscle score, in which you can classify by touching the bird chest and feeling the cue, and we also weighted it. These are the measurements in, in common for both 2019 and 20, 2020, or years on field. But on 2020, we felt we needed to add some more variables we felt we reported, which were moat. As you can see in the picture, we have a clear molting process with the brown feathers being old ones, ready to fall, and the black ones are fresh feathers. So that's why we decided to add. We also added some wing and tail measurements and also tail measurements because we felt they were also important. And to get the number of days they stay at the roost or roost permanence, we use tags registered on the model's wildlife tracking system, an international collaborative research network that uses radio telemetry to facilitate research. These tags are radio transmitters that emit a signal that is received by an antenna close to the roof area. What we get in the end are data about presence or absence of a tagged bird. So we can count how many days they were detected until we no longer receive a signal. So as results, in total, we tagged 59 birds, of which 30 were female, female and 29 were male. Also, from those 59 birds, 49 were aided and 10 were eelings. And as you can see on the right, on the left, most of the birds stay at the roost for one or two weeks, with only a few staying for a period longer than 20 days, a short time when compared to the period of four months that the roost stays active. And from all the variables we measured, the ones relevant were age, which you can see here, the adults in general stay more than yearlings. 
And it's relevant to note see, that we only captured 10 yieldings. So this could be a result of the low number of individuals caught. Or if the yearlings are really staying less than adults, they, they, that they can be going somewhere else other than these rules. Fat score also appears to be a relevant variable. With the birds with the biggest fat score, which means the biggest fat reserves, were staying less than birds with less fat reserves. Our interpretation for this can be that the ones with higher fat scores are ready to go, while the ones with less still need more time to prepare. Muscle score was the third relevant variable at present the same patterns as fat score. The ones with the highest muscle score were ones stayed for less time at the roost, which can also mean they were, they were ready for migration, thus needing less time to prepare. Now for the variables we added on 2020. Moat appeared to be important. Most of the birds we caught had fresh feathers and, and the moat was done. But the ones who still had feathers left to moat tended to stay longer at the roost, which may mean they still needed time to complete moat before leaving. And the last variable that was relevant was pointness which is a measure of how pointed or rounded wings are. It uses the lens of the primary and secondary flight feathers that form the basis of the wing shape to determine where the wings are pointed or rounded. Pointy wings are more energy efficient and is believed to be adaptation for longer flights. So Martis with pointy wings may be those who have the longest journeys to make. As you can see here, the pointier the wings, the more they tend to stay. Of course, we need more data, but this can also mean the longer the journeys, the more time, the more preparation time they need. So, as conclusion, our count estimated numbers varying from 240,000 to 320,000 birds. And since most stay for only a week or two, this may suggest a rotation of birds at the roost, with new ones arriving and others leaving. Also, age, fat score, muscle score, mold, and wing pointedness appear to be important traits to determine how long they stay at the roost. These are clues that the roost is not only a place to sleep, but the important process are happening there, making this a possible stage roost. Of course, we still need more data, but this is a starting point. Well, this sums up everything I want to tell you today. So huge thanks for everyone involved in this project. It would take minutes to thank everyone, but I would like to thank the support of researchers from all of those institutions. I would like to thank my advisor, Mario, from the National Institute of Amazon Research, my co-advisor Kevin from the University of Manitoba, Joe from the Popo Modern Conservation Association, and also the whole PMC for giving us the means to go to the field and collect data. Also, huge thanks to Zé, the guy who was with us on all those fields, catching Martin, Martins, pilot the boat and ranging as a floating station to work on. Also, huge thanks to everyone for the floating station and everyone involved. Without you, it wouldn't be possible. And please feel free to ask me any questions and I appreciate the opportunity of being present here today. Thank you so much and bye. All right, thank you so much, Eliane. All right. Wonderful work, Eliane. I, I, I wanna take a moment here and just recognize that how much Eliane and uh, Jessica, who's following her up here, um, how much COVID and the shutdown uh, has affected their research plans and their graduate work. Um, you know, they were just getting started and then COVID came in and shut everything down. And it was really quite terrible in, in uh, Manaus and throughout Brazil. But, um, and then, you know, they, 
had a small amount of data that they were able to gather, not nearly as much as they had wanted to, but still were able to do great science and uh, uh, to to have these results to show for it. So uh, I just wanted to congratulate them on uh, doing so much with so much adversity uh, that they had to face there. Um, Eliani, uh, I have a question here in chat. Uh, from Dan, he says, can you combine counts with turnover rates to come up with a total number of birds using the roost over the entire season? So do you have a total a number of purple martins that use that roost uh, overall? Oh, I see you're, you didn't get uh, unmuted. I'm so sorry. There you oh, go. Hi. No, no, I'm unmuted. And uh, so... What was the question? Um, yeah, so Dan is wondering if you can combine the counts that you were making uh, with the turnover rate that you were calculating, so how quickly they were leaving, to come up with the total number of purple martins that use that roost during the entire season. So that's a, a really good idea because just recently, recently we saw that there this turnover rate that we see. So after analyzing all this data, just recently we started with this hypothesis that there is a, a rotativity at the roost. So we really needed to take it now all this data we have and uh, analyze it a little further. So that's a great idea. It's something we should do. Yeah, that's something that we'll be looking on. And I think that was really part of the original uh, kind of dream of this research was to figure out how important this one roost is to the species as a whole because we've got 300,000 martins or more at any one time and if they're only staying for a couple of weeks and it's active how long would you say that the roost is active Elian? so it's active from january to late january to april more or less uh the first birds we registered were on the roost from the 20 20 from january 20 and on and the last birds we detected at the roofs were more or less on April 14 or 15. Uh, we still believe that there are martins that stay at the roofs until late April, like the very end of April, from what Zay and all the other people at the roofs, uh, close to the roofs, say to us. But uh, in general, it's from late January to April. Yeah, so you got to think that, you know, it's really a significant uh, proportion of the entire purple martin population of the eastern subspecies that stops at that roost and clearly well i don't know if clearly but uh, i would say from the fact that when we were there about the same week in two uh two separate years that we caught birds from connecticut that you know throughout that season birds from farther north are finally arriving and then migrating north right um d kirk asks uh amazing presentation are the counts going to continue for a number of years yeah we have plans to continue with our counts uh, even more with ways to figure out how can we uh, make, uh, separate the purple martins from all the other species from the roost uh, because we know there are a lot of brown chested martins on the roost and we cannot actually separate these two and I don't think it's possible with a counter method, but we really need to figure out all these uh, different ways of counting and maybe even employ something like a radar or lidar to mm -hmm. help us to count with more precision. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a lot of uh, difficult logistics to make regular visits to this roost, even though it's uh, not terribly far from Manaus, it's a lot of work to get there and you need several, you need two boats worth of four people in each boat. Um, it, it's a lot of work if you're going to do regular counts throughout the season. And the, the original plan was for Eliani, you and Jessica to live out there the entire season during the roost. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, let me see here. Um, I've got one more question here. Madeline asks, has there been any research at locations in North America that correlate wing pointedness 
with how far north the birds are located since that was suggested in this study? Yes, there is one study that was the inspiration to calculate the wing pointedness of the, those birds. And it's from one of the students from Kevin Fraser, Dr. Kevin Fraser. Uh, his name, I know that his surname is Lawrence. He did some work with, uh, with wing pointedness and he, show, uh, he has shown that there is some correlation on the wing pointedness and how far they are migrating. So it's a really nice work to check it out. Yeah, yeah. was that um, published as a paper or was it just in his thesis? I can't recall any. I guess it's only his thesis uh, okay. as far as I know. Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think it made it into a book. Uh, on the PMCA's website, under research, there's a publications page and Lawrence's thesis is in there if you would like to see that. Um, and then uh john bolga is asking is there weather radar that can be used in conjunction with the count um I, I know that that's that's the plan that's the hope right is to is to compare that uh with weather radar eliani yeah as far as i'm aware i don't think there is any clothes or any we can use we really still looking for ways to make this happen but for the time being not really yeah yeah it, it's gonna take some work and the hope is uh you know hopefully maybe we can get maria to help us uh analyze some of that brazilian uh radar data from manaus if it's able to reach that far uh we don't even know that so um and also if anybody in chat happens to have a, a radar mounted on a truck that wants to drive down to brazil <laughs> we would love to have you uh I don't know. We could find a grant for gas money, maybe. You get your name in the paper as well. So <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Yeah, you could get pub publication from it. All right. Well, Eliani, thank you so much for uh, your work and uh, great job. And thank you for being a part of the uh, of the conference. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here.